I'm Danny. I'm from Germany, Berlin. I'm working for Viacom in our office there, although our headquarters is in New York. And thanks to the organizer, Mike, he asked me to add a lot of South Park to my slides, as I like to do that. So if you don't enjoy the slides or the topic, at least there's a lot of South Park in there. Um, let's start. I want to talk about view model. View model and a few of the related classes, components, and the architecture components. Anyone here went to Google I.O. this year? No one? Okay. I was. Uh, I mean, of course, I had like goosebumps the moments they announced like Kotlin because I'm a big Kotlin fan and I used it before. But yeah, this, the second big thing was the architecture components that they announced. So, what is in there? Um, what is in those architecture components? Um, so, we have a few of them in there. Um, one is room, and Mark, he's sitting right there, I can see you. He will talk later, a complete full hour just about room. So we can focus on the other ones. And just a few weeks ago, there came another one in, this is a pagination library, which is not released like the rest of the architecture components. It's still alpha. But pagination will be hopefully very soon, as smooth as all the other things um, when we use architecture components. So what was the whole thing about this? Um, you know, in the past, one of the big difference for me, come in, come in, we just started. Um, one of the big difference for me in Android and iOS was, in iOS there was always a specific way how to do something. It was, use this class to do this job, right? In Android we had like all the freedom of the world. And I'm doing Android for quite some time. And it gave us a lot of opportunities, but it was also hard for a lot of um, newcomers to, to get into Android. How do I do this, right? And then we had, in the end, we created a lot of those massive apps of massive activities and fragments and created actually a lot of mess, right? Um, and you've probably all seen those apps. We all refactored those. We all threw them away because they were beyond refactoring. Um, so Google started, I think, to, to step, a, step a bit back and thought, you know, for the very first time, we tell you how you maybe should architecture an app because there are so many ways out there. So as part of the architecture components, they gave some architectural guidelines how they think uh, you should build an Android app. And I will have a slide later in there. Um, and to make it easy for you, they gave us all these components to make this possible so that not all of us keep reinventing the wheel, right? The big thing is you don't have to use them. And this is, if there's one thing to take out of this talk, this stuff is really cool but you don't have to use it. You can keep going as is. But we're aware of those, and maybe for the next app, keep using them. Or use one, you don't have to use all of them. That's what's the nice thing for me about architecture components. But let's talk about view model. My first, and probably most of us, we thought like view model, is this like the view model out of model view, view model? So the MVVM pattern. Um, and was one of the first thing I think uh, most of us asked the Google developers uh, at Google I.O. So do you think like MVVM is now the thing we have to use? And at least Egit, um, one of the developers there, he said, it's definitely something that they see is very fitting well with Android, so you should con consider using it. But it's not limited to this. But the idea definitely comes from there. So let's look at MVVM for a second. So if you're familiar to MVP, you can think of the view model as the presenter. So you would have an MVP, you would have a view, you would have a model, and you would have a presenter in the middle. And for me, MVVM is more like an MVP plus. So it's like a better version of MVP because it solves one problem. Normally, between the view and the view model in MVP, uh, so the view and the presenter, you have two of those errors because both know about each other. That's why we have to put an interface in between them to not have the cyclic dependency. MVVM solved this. MVVM was basically comes from Microsoft. I think they first, uh, I would not say invented it, but described it. And it was very meant for data binding. And this is one of the ways you can use an Android. Um, so basically a view would bind to a view model and get all the updates automatically. So the view model has no idea about the view. And then the view model would talk to models to get your entities. This could be like repositories, whatever, right? So don't see model very strict, but it's the same in MVP. So this is MVVM as it is, not architecture components, right? So let's look at what 
Google says how you should build your Android app now. So they say, you know you have activities and fragments. And then I was very clever putting like black arrows on like a black background. So there's an arrow going to the view model. There's like some live data. Let's just ignore it so we haven't heard of this before for now. And then you're going to a repository layer and then there could be a remote data set like uh, retrofit for doing your REST calls. And there could be like a database on the other side of the room, but this is, you don't know, there's a repository layer in between. So if you ever heard like a clean architecture, this is a bit like inspired by this. And when we zoom in a bit, so thinking about what we just saw with MVVM, I think what Google says like, hey, this is basically your view. There's a view model and you go to a repository to create a model. So this looks very much like MVVM for me. So the first question you might ask, is MVP dead now? What is with like my MVP apps, right? Most apps still use it. So I would say it's a bit like Java and Kotlin. You know, MVP will stay for quite some time and you're totally safe if you're using MVP in Android. But there is a new cool kid in town and it won't go away. So you should not ignore him. And if you use MVP, and when you look at a lot of blogs um, about the new view model, what they basically say is start by using the view model and put it behind your presenter. So you can have a slow transition to this new way of. So why should you care about this view model? Let's look at what Google gives us as the view model in terms of the architecture components. So like an MVVM, they say, you know, a view model provides you data for UI. It holds all the UI relevant data because we have to remove them from activities and fragments, right? Put them somewhere else. It's the view model who holds those data. And then ask another layer for, for the logic to get this data. It's very important that this is the same as with MVVM. The view model does not know about the view. There was no dependency error back to the view. It has no idea about it. And the one big thing about this view model and architecture components is it survives configuration change. And this is the one thing where you should think about using it. So, so where's configuration change? What was configuration change? Just remember um, that is rotation, right? Rotate your phone. Remember everything is gone and everything gets recreated. And one of the biggest pain points in Android development. The view model survives that now. But there's also more things nowadays that can be configuration change. Um, we have split screens since Android N. So Android split screen, basically, you go from a portrait into a landscape. So it's like a rotation, right? The configuration of the app changes. But I'm from Germany, so I change the language all the time. Um, testing my app, for example, a language change is a configuration change. Everything gets thrown away and recreated. So we don't want to, to go in an inconsistent state of your app just because of this. And we created all, all of us created a lot of bugs because of this, right? Because we kind of ignored that problem. So let's look at this. So let's assume this could be an activity or a fragment. It gets created, uh, there's on create, on start, resume. Then it dies at some point um, and a new one gets created. So we're talking about the rotation case. The next thing is the view model is the same all over this. So you get one view model here and as a new activity gets created and you keep using the same view model, all the data is still there. And you might think, okay, I can write that. But the nice thing is with architecture components, if the activity actually dies, if the user presses the back button and goes somewhere else, the view model dies too. So it's really bound to the, to the life cycle of your activity, but survives the orientation change and configuration change. So how do we actually use this? Let's look at it. Go to your Gradle, add the life cycle extensions. Um, um, if, First, if you're wondering what is this implementation, if you um, haven't seen Android Studio 3 yet, this is the way we write it now. Normally, you are used to compile. Now there are two versions of this implementation API. So think about this as compile, just add the lifecycle uh, component here. Uh, there's a 1.0, this is not alpha, not beta, not release candidate, this thing is stable and in production. Since a week, I think now. And there's an annotation processor, which you need uh, for the lifecycle observer, which you need for room. So you might have to add this. Um, of course, I'm using Kotlin, so I use the KAPT here. And as I said, I'm using Kotlin, so you won't see a single Java slide on my, my talk. Um, why? Because I like it. And I've been to a lot of conferences since Google I.O. 
and I haven't seen a single line of Java code since then. So the community is really digging into it. And if you haven't used Kotlin, you should really look into it. But believe me, the examples are that simple. You will understand them anyway. So how do you use it? If you already have a view, have your view model, all you have to do is extend by the class view model that Google gives you. That's basically all you have to do. If you need like an application context, which honestly we need most of the time, there's another one that you can extend. There's an Android view model. Also, that's simple. Um, I'm a big fan of data binding. And one of the first things I realized when trying this out was in the first alpha, yes, my view model already extends a class. This is the base observable uh, that Google gives you in data binding. So I can't extend view model. What do I do? So I talked, we talked to Google and they said they promised there will be a view model observable too that you can extend. Um, and Ige just confirmed this last week. It, it, it will be there. It's not there yet, but it's easy basically create this yourself and copy the, the, the source code from base observable into the view model. That's the only problem I see right now with data binding. So this is how we extend the view model, but how do we actually use it, right? So let's look at our activity. This is how you get with your view model. There's a class called view model providers, and you would ask it, hey, okay, with this context, give me this view model. And this call will decide, do we already have one of those from like the last configuration change, for example? Else I will create one. So you don't care about anymore uh, how this gets created, which is pretty cool. But if the moment you try this out, you probably realize, hey, my view model needs like constructed arguments. How do we pass them? Bam, problem, right? No, it's actually really easy if you need constructor arguments. Um, all you have to do is create like one of those factories and those factories would then uh, create your view model, for example, pass a use case here, what, what I, I do use here. And then the call is just slightly different. You would pass in the view model provider's call a factory. And this factory instance, for example, could be injected in Dagger. So it's not like you have to know about this. Um, one thing here that I would recommend, always build your own factory. Why? You know, the default factory uses new instance because or else can create your view model that doesn't know about it, right? So it takes a class and creates new instance. There's a problem. Remember that we always were told don't use reflection. Reflection is like the evil thing of Android. There was a really nice talk earlier this year uh, in, in uh, I think in Russia um, by Stefan Nikolais. And Nikolais, he's the guy behind the libraries like RoboSpice, um, Toothpick. He worked for um, RoboJuice a lot of the, a long time. So he was actually investigating what is slow in reflection on Android. What is, here the, what is the big problem? And he realized a lot of things are not slow. Getting a field, reading it, setting it. It's not that slow. It's like double, four times as slow as you would do it by, by normal Java call. But creating new instance is the big problem. This can be 100 times slower. This was the big problem of libraries like Robots, RoboJuice, right? Because they did all those uh, instantiations where reflection. Um, it's not an issue if you have like one view model per activity, but if you have a few of them, maybe in all your fragments, and if you really have a very separated UI with a lot of fragments, maybe consider using a factory. Then you can control and you don't have like a problem because of a lot of new instance calls here, just as a tip. So let's assume you have this view model, now you extend it, this new Android component view model. Next thing you probably have to do remove all those lifecycle forwarding calls that you have in there. Because we probably had like an on stop call that we forwarded from the activity on stop or from the fragment on stop, right? Um, we don't need this anymore. Why? Because it survives configuration change. So get rid of those. But what if there's really something I need to uh, clean up, like closing a database or something, right? Um, actually, there's one method that ViewModel has. It's a one single one. It's called uncleared. And you can overwrite this and clear your subscriptions or you close your database. But this is only gets called if the activity dies. This is not getting called on configuration change. So not called on rotation, which makes sense, right? Because even if the activity is not there, the results should be in the view model. And next time you, you attach again, it should be there. So this is a bit of like a different way of thinking. So the question most developers ask now is, okay, 
how did they do this? How did they solve this problem of the configuration change? So let's look into the code. And I said you will only see Kotlin code. That's not true because that thing's implemented in Java. So I have to show you Java code now. So this is how they do it. This is the code out of the architecture components. They created a fragment and set, set retain instance to true. If you are on Android for longer, you know that this is one of the patterns how you could solve this problem. You create a so-called headless fragment, a retain fragment. And if you don't believe me, just check for this tag in the fragment manager and you will find this fragment. It is really there. That's how they did it. So next question. But wait, how do they know that the activity is actually finishing, right? To call uncleared, to remove everything. It's that simple. That's as a headless fragment. It's a retain fragment. And it has an undestroy and it gets destroyed when activity dies. As simple as it is. And all they have is basically a hash map. This is seriously a hash map um, with all the view models in there. They just cleared. So there is no magic in there. Mm. One thing that I realized then, wait, does this mean that this view model does not use the new lifecycle observer? I mean, there's another architecture component called lifecycle observer where I can observe all this. No, it just refuses to die. It is really simple. They did a really simple implementation. So, and when you think about how they do this, they use a retained fragment. And they were called headless fragment when fragments came out. Why? Because they should not relate to any view or activity. This is why it's really important to follow the MVVM rule to never hold any view or activity ref reference in your view model. The moment you have this, you are probably close to memory leak. Yes, it's, it lives longer, right? So now you're probably super excited and said, hey, can you tell me more about this? So how do we actually use it? What's like the use case for it? Let's look at something. Let's assume we have two fragments. And two fragments of the same activity. And they use this call that I just showed you. View model providers of this, give me my view model. What will they get? What do you think? Will they get the same view model or two different ones? Give you a second. So view model providers of this, two fragments, they will get two different view models. Um, why? Because they use is this, is that's a fragment. So two fragments, uh, so it will be two different activity, uh, two different view models. But if you're really uh, looking into it, and maybe you realize, wait, 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 wait. I know that two fragments share with the activity the same fragment manager. And you, I showed you like the tech that uh, the, the holder fragment is using, right? So why is it two different view models? That's because they always use the child fragment manager of the fragments. So seriously, if you have two fragments, they use a child fragment manager, you will have two of those holder fragments, it means two of those hash tables, it means all the view models are completely separated. So what about if we change this a little bit and use the off with the get activity? Same use case, right? Two fragments, and now we pass in the activity. As you might guess, then you get the same view models for both. Why am I telling you this? I think this offers a very nice opportunity how to use this view model. You can totally define, I want this view model, but I want to, um, I want to define by this call if I get a shared one, the activity one, or if I want a specific one in all the fragments. Although you might be using the same class. I think this is like a really nice thing to, to think about how you architecture your app. So now you're even more excited. You said, okay, tell me more. What else can I do? So except the typical thing that I like thinking of MVVM, so it holds AUI data. Google says, you know, there are two more use cases where this really, really makes sense. One is start using this as your communication layer between your fragments and between fragment activities. So when fragments came out, it was Android Honeycomb, maybe someone remember that. Um, they said, you know, in on attach of the, of the fragment, take the activity, cast it to an interface, and then you can communicate. If you ever tried this, and then you want later want to change your app, you realize this is not scalable. This created a lot of mess. This wasn't the best practice. So this gives us a new chance to, to reevaluate. Because what did we do, right? We stopped using this pattern. We used event pass, which lead to we used event pass everywhere. And we created a mess. Now probably we use RX subjects or something like this, right? Use the view model. You can define, as I said, to share one with the activity and use this as a communication layer. 
set something in where the fragment, and all the fragments get notified because they're using the same view model. It's a pretty cool thing. And it's a very clean way of using it because they're just, they're bound to a view model and they get notified. They have no idea where this comes from. And there's a second use case that Google says, think about using the view model now. Anyone still uses Lotus? So I remember like a, site, a time where we used this a lot. We used like a database, SQLite, a content provider. We had a list, uh, list uh, fragment or something like this. So basically, you would use a loader, a cursor loader, and automatically get notified if something changed in the database. This was a pretty cool pattern. Just hope that everything always went well, because else it was really hard to debug. Now, when you use the view model together with Room, which we heard later from, from, from Mark, um, and combine it with something like Live Data or IX Server, you can build the same thing in a much, much nicer way. So you might think, okay, that's all cool, but I saw how it implemented. I could write that. Why should I even care about this? I probably already written this in the past, right? Actually, when digging into the, um, how, how Google implemented it, they thought about some nice edge cases. So let's assume you're asking in your view, for your view model in two fragments, um, which we saw it uses a holder fragment. But we all know that fragment transactions are not uh, done immediately. So what if both ask for the same view model and they want the same view model, but the fragment transaction isn't done, so the holder fragment isn't there, so you end up with duplications. So you might have to think about this. They solved this. There's a lot of code. Basically, very simple code. They have like two hash maps where they, they have like the pre-commit and the committed ones. So they thought about this case. They thought about another case. Um, what if the activity dies before the fragment transaction is executed? You might have memory leaks, right? You're putting something in, in, in hash maps somewhere in memory. So there's a lot of code to prevent this, and they basically use the, the old style activity lifecycle callbacks uh, that you could use to make sure this case is handled. So a lot of ugly code that you don't need to write because they handle all these cases. And you know, I start looking to view models in I think alpha three or something, and the code of the whole view model didn't change a single bit since the, 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 the gold master and now the release candidate, which is pretty cool. So they got it right from the first place. Um, so now, all the problems are solved, right? We're living in a happy, happy world. Uh, when I flew here, I heard this is the happiest place on Earth. Now we have the, the coolest API, right? And let's read a bit more. You know, documentation says, view model provides you a nice way to retain data across configuration changes. But it cannot persist if the application is killed by the operating system. You might say, what, 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 why, why, what's going on here? So remember we used to use onsafe instance. We had like a bundle, we put everything there. On rotation, we would get the data back. On recreation, we would get the data back in both cases. Yeah, but they clarified this a little bit. You know, the thing that you use an onsafe instance and put into your bundle, this is hold in the system process memory. That means all your application put it in the same place. If you create add a lot of data there, and we probably did, I did in the past, um, you might enter one into a transaction to large exception. So maybe you experience this. This is exactly the reason. And also, if the phone gets rebooted, it's all thrown away. It just sits there in memory. So using unsafe instance to store all your UI data, I think, was another thing that they didn't really describe well in the beginning. And we are misusing it. But it means that this new view model gives us the rotation support without using bundles, but it takes away the recreation support. For me, it was always a really nice feature of Android that I could reopen app after two weeks and it's in the exact same state they left it. Might be confusing sometimes, but I really like this. For me, this was one of the big Android features. And this is because recreation, rotation is all the same way. So how do we handle this now? So you know what we should do is keep all the non-UI state that's not relevant for the UI itself in the non-UI layer. And the bundle was a UI layer. So don't put it there. The nice thing is you can use like your real caching strategies. It could be your HTTP layer, it could be your database layer, whatever, right? You can have multiple like layers like we have them in the backend. And it gives us, when we start separating this, better possibilities. For example, think about the case they just described. 
Mm. You come back to an app, and everything was read out of the bundle, so it is the data from three weeks ago. In a lot of apps, that doesn't make sense because you want to refresh data, right? If you use like a better caching strategy, you could update in the background via a job scheduler or something like this, or via push notification. So if you keep it out of the bundle, because the bundle is not updatable from the background, it's much nicer. But sounds nice. But let's think about some UI components. So let's think about edit text. And edit text saves its text in a bundle. So you might have in a case where the edit text restores its text, but the view model has no idea about this anymore because it, it lost that data. So where do we store that UI state? Because it's UI state, non UI state, we just learned, right? That's what Google tells us to. UI state, it belongs in the bundles. That's simple, as it was before. So who owns that UI state? I would say, in the model, the view model. Now you might wait, what, what, what? I don't get it. So the way I tweeted this for, for me, to tweak this, is the following way. You know, I would, when I created my factory, would pass the bundle in. And the, in that moment where I really need a view, new view model, so where the system decides I get a new view model, I would read from that bundle. So I only have to do it in that case. So I can still save all the data in the bundle as, uh, as I did, but use the view model to not read it all the time because I don't need it most of the time on configuration change. So you would still have to pass the, the writing all the time. This is a bit problematic, but it just shouldn't cost you too much because this is just the UI state, right? The rest is in a different layer. So there was like a lot of view model. Now you might think, Okay, so what about this lifecycle thing that view model doesn't use, right? Let's look at this for a second. Um, basically, the whole lifecycle observing part of the architecture components, it's like three classes. I mean, view model was one class, right? Super easy. Um, so one class is lifecycle. A lifecycle is a class that holds the information about the lifecycle state of a component. So it tells us in which state am I right now. So there can be different life cycles. I mean, there's activities, there's fragments, there's the application, right? So there's a second class called the life cycle owner. This is the class that's, um, of which life cycle you want to observe. And then there's the actual life cycle observer. So this is how you would implement the whole thing. So you would cre create your life cycle observer by extending it, and then you would create method and use annotations for those events you need. This is a pretty neat trick. You don't have to overwrite like all of them. You can name them however you want and just tell them, okay, this is the on-start event. And then depending on who is your lifecycle um, owner, like a fragment or activity, the system will call you. Of course, you have to add your uh, head observer somewhere. So you barely, for example, activity. If you haven't seen Kotlin, this is basically the get lifecycle call. Uh, Kotlin gives you this nice property syntax. You add your observer, that's it. So this would register for an activity lifecycle. In most of the example I've seen about this, the next thing they would show you is how to unregister your observer. But you don't have to. Uh, and documentation says um, it's automatically, because it knows about the lifecycle. So in the destroyed state, it will remove your observer, which is a pretty neat thing. So you don't even have to unregister, which again makes our life so much easier to what we probably had before. So, and there's one really, really cool thing that a few weeks ago we got. So, drums please. So, Lifecycle Observer gives us the process lifecycle owner now. Remember those cases where your marketing want to know when your application goes to the background, when it gets started, when it gets killed, all of those. It was really hard for us because every activity stands on its own. There's now a process lifecycle owner that gives you exactly this information. I found this is like amazing. Actually, when you look at it, how they implement it, it's very simple. They use the, the life cycle, the global life cycle, uh, activity life cycle, and basically count the activities that are there. Very simple. But again, we don't have to write it ourselves anymore. So now we have a view model, we have a life cycle observer, and maybe you ask yourself, so should my view model implement this? And no, please, please, don't. Don't even have this idea. Why? Remember, I told you that the view model, it lives longer than the activity. And all the activity, lifecycle observing, is about those small events that happen here. You're not interested in them anymore. 
you don't have anything to do with the activity. But maybe you still have some use cases where we, you kind of need it, right? And there, Google gives us another class. It's called life data. It's basically, so the view model lives longer, but there's something that has a life cycle. And the way they suggest you to bind to a view model is using life data, which is basically some similar, you can think about if you know RxJava to an RxJava um, observable. I'll look at this in a second. But you would observe life data to a view model, and this thing is life cycle aware. So this class knows when this dies and removes itself. So basically, you would, um, so when the change came to the view model and there is no one to listen, it would notify. So it was used as a nice life cycle observation um, without making a, a view model or your activity in any way like polluting with this code. So what is life data? It is an observable similar to RxJava. It's actually much simpler, so one of the reasons Google said you should look into life data is RxJava is fucking hard to understand. I mean, seriously, Kotlin you learn in a week, I think after half a year you still have issues with RxJava, in my experience, um, to understand all of the cases. So the nice thing is it's life cycle aware, so it knows about all the life cycle, um, and it will just not emit uh, if no one is listening, which is a nice way to be memory leak safe. So how would you use it in your view model? Um, so you would expose, for example, a, um, a variable message, um, and you would, this would be a string, you would wrap it basically in this live data. So this is a mutable live data, that means I can modify it. And whoever listens to, and the listening looks like this, so my model, message, observe, uh, and you would create this observer, which is just the implementation of one method to, to handle it. And this is the life cycle that you observe from. So this is really simple. So expose immutable life data and use it. But you know, I really like RxJava. It's maybe something you, you, you're thinking now. I don't want to switch to life data. And actually, a lot of people say it like this. They got so used to RxJava and they use it everywhere. They use Rx bindings and all of those nice things. So how do I can use the whole same thing with RxJava, right? So ignore the life, life cycle that I just told you. The same thing, right? You can expose uh, uh, Rx here in your view model. You would subscribe on it and make sure you unsubscribe. But better is get it out of the activity and build something like a lifecycle aware component, lifecycle aware class. So this one would then know about life cycles of this one. So you build a similar thing, but you can use RxJava here. And again, don't pollute your activity with all these things. So we could use view model, we could use the lifecycle observer for this class and have a similar effect to uh, live data. But you know, I told you like MVVM comes from a data binding um, background. What if I want to use data binding with my view models? I can't use live data, right? So if you've never heard of data binding, it basically looks like this. You have an XML and it directly binds to a view model. And I'm not only a fan of Kotlin, I'm a big fan of data binding and this thing of data binding with MVVM. Why? The big problem in my, um, as I see it, with MVP, MVVM, all of this is, there's one question, who is the view? And ask like five different people, you get five different answers. It's activity, it's a fragment, it's a custom view. It is a class and nothing to do with all of these, right? With data binding, it is so simple. It is the XML, there is no other class there. There is no other class. So you would directly bind your XML to a view model and remove this whole layer. There's, there's no questioning. The team knows exactly who the view is. How does it look like? In your XML, you would declare, hey, I need this view model. Um, and then, for example, a click could be forwarded directly. Or, you know, the text of this text view would directly be bound to a property title of a view model. And whenever I change this, it's automatically updated in the UI. I don't have to care about this anymore. So I'm a big fan of this approach. But a lot of people look into this, yeah, yeah. But you know, this only works for the super, for the that simple cases, right? My application is much more simple. I have dialogues and everything, and I can't do this with data binding. So how do we show a toast with this, right? That's a valid question. So you can have a very similar, so there are two approaches I can see here. So one is use something similar, that looks very similar to what we saw with live data. You would wrap your field, for example, you would expose an error. 
an error string. And whenever this string is set, someone will watch this and show you a toast. So for me, this is a very different way of thinking and I like this of MVM because you don't think in flows anymore. It's like there's an error, okay? So I need to expose it somehow and someone will listen on it. So you completely decouple the whole flow. So I don't know who's looking into this. But you would define an observable field, mark it as bindable to get updates. And then uh, you would simply change it like you would do with mutable life data. Some people find this really awkward, but they say, you know, observable fields, this is what data binding use under the hood, what the, what the compiler uses. Um, should I use it directly? And actually, absolutely. Architecture blueprints, when you look at Google's implementation, that's exactly how they use a show a toast. The way we use it is a little bit different because what I don't like is that sometimes I would expose strings and sometimes observable fields. So I somehow, I mix two things here that I don't like. So another way how you can use it with, um, with data binding is to use a so-called uh, binding adapter, which is basically, oh, so first is the use case, so on the error, you would listen on a change and then you can show your toast. Sorry, I forgot to show you this. So the other way is, I would create a so-called binding adapter. So in, I would, in the XML somewhere, bind to this error appeared. So this is this error string, right, of the view model. Yeah, should error, sorry. So this is view model error as we saw before. Um, and then I would create a custom sort of binding adapter, which just has a string, which is this. This is the one that you use, the custom attribute, use XML. And this method gets actually called whenever this changed. So it's really, really, really nice way. Although it's a bit confusing sometimes to read it, to follow the flow here, but I think this is nicer than exposing the observable fields. So let's look at this again. For view model, you could bind from the XML. Of course, you could bind directly from the activity, but better use lifecycle where classes if you want to. The nice thing is with data binding, you don't need to unbind. Um, so we have basically three ways how we could bind data from a view model. Using data binding, using ArcJava, using live data. You can totally pick here, whatever your favorite is. Um, you could even go further. Maybe you don't want to use the architecture component view model at all, which might sound weird because I'm talking about view model here from architecture components. But you could build something like this. Actually, that's what, what we did with our q and app. We was ignoring the architecture component view model and made our view models lifecycle aware, which is something that I told you earlier you should not, right? But it's possible because those are not so having configuration change. Because all the caching is here, we don't have much UI state. So we made the life cycle, the view models lifecycle aware. Why? To still get rid of all these forwarding calls. So the view model itself got like on stop, on, 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 on paused, whatever, without even noticing a note, without even knowing if this is the on pause from an activity or a fragment or whoever. So I like this approach. And again, you would still use architecture components. You would use a life cycle. So what is what I want to tell you here? I think that what they give us, what Google gave us, architecture components, it's a really nice and well-designed API. And it helps you to find a common language all over your team, if you love a large team, but even outside of your team. I mean, if you follow like, what the patterns that Google gives you and use those components, a new member in the team will much easier understand what, you, what you're doing there, right? Because right now, come on, we have like, everybody's using MVP and everybody's doing it differently. I have like so many different variations. And even for MVVM, this happens. So using some of the components, it's a really nice uh, thing to, to solve this problem. But what I want to tell you is, use only the ones that you need. You don't have to build the whole picture. I mean, Google tells you this is how you can build an Android app, but this is more directed to new apps, especially for beginners. If you have like a clean, clean architecture, you have much more layers probably already than the one that Google suggests. You should not tear this apart. You did a really good job there. But maybe there are some parts, like we did with the Lifecycle Observer for our view models, that make sense without taking in the whole ship. And that's what I really like about the architecture components. So, but remember, know about Lifecycle. Don't put any uh, view activity in your view model. And the nice thing, as I mentioned, since one week it's production ready, and there's a lot of things you don't have to do anymore. Um, so I want you to have a look at there. There are tons of blog posts out there where you 
use them, what's good, what's not good, for example, from Hannes Dorfmann here. There's some really good uh, YouTube videos, one from, the, from Florina from Google, from the Google Developer Day, explaining all of this like in a full hour. And there's a really nice one about View Model 2 from like a week ago or so. So look at those. I will put the slides online um, today. So just look at the, the Twitter account that they first. And now I'm open for questions. Um, why do I use South Park? Because South Park is Comedy Central. Comedy Central is Viacom, which is the company I'm working for. And yeah, now I'm open for questions. Thank you.